Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and we and bore by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he, which he, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are the workmanship of created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk with them. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> it's great to see you in worship with you today. And I want to give a special word of thanks again to our worship team. I don't know if you are all aware how blessed we are in a church this size to have so many gifted worship leaders. Um, <laughs> I know you're not doing it for our applause, but just know how grateful that we are, not only for their musical skills, but that they really help lead us in worshiping God uh, week after week. And so thank you very much. Uh, Let's take a moment and pray. Dear God, we know that it is only by your grace that we can enter your presence. We could never do it on the basis of our own goodness. But we thank you and praise you that you are a gracious God. And so by your grace we can enter. We can stand before you, the living God, beholding your greatness, your mercy, your love. And we know that for all of eternity we, we will be doing that in ever richer ways. But thank you that even now we can experience your grace in our lives. And Lord, we pray that as we think more deeply about your grace this morning, that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you are a parent, I'm sure that you have spent some time uh, dreaming, imagining what you would like the future for your child or children to be like. You think about the things that you hope they will experience in life. And so you no doubt hope that they will do, ac- do well academically in school, and you hope that they will have healthy friendships, someday that they will have a meaningful career. Of course, you hope that they will have a close walk with God, and so on. I mean, there are many things that we hope for for our children that they will experience in life. Of course, basically, we hope that they will be successful, that, they, that life will be both enjoyable and meaningful for them. And, of course, as their parents, you would do whatever you can to help those dreams, those hopes come about for your children. Well, if that is true for us as human parents, what do you suppose our Heavenly Father desires for us, His children? What does he desire that we would experience in life? We know, of course, that our Heavenly Father loves us more than any earthly parent ever could. So we know that he desires good things for our lives. And I suppose that there are many good things that God desires for us. But we'll focus uh, mostly on just one of those things today. And we find it in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, in the first two verses. We're actually going to uh, spend a number of weeks now looking at the book of Philippians. This is such a great book of Scripture, so encouraging for us in many ways. And so uh, we will spend 
several months looking at uh, this book that the Apostle Paul wrote. And so today we're only looking at the first two verses of chapter 1. And there Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's as far as we're going today. This is a very typical way that a letter would begin in the ancient Middle East. It follows the typical format in that there are three distinct parts to this opening of the letter. First, the writer would always identify himself or herself. A lot of times we, today, we put that at the very end, but back then they didn't make you read through the whole letter before you discovered who was writing to you. They put right at the beginning who was writing. And so in this case, it's Paul and Timothy. That's why he begins that way. That's how they began letters at that time. And then the recipient of the letter would be identified right after that. And so in this case, Paul says that it's to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. Now, saints does not refer to a special class of Christians. It doesn't refer to those who are maybe a little bit uh, more spiritual than others or holier than others. No, in Scripture, a saint is simply a believer in Jesus. Someone who has been called by God, and set apart by God to experience God's grace and to fulfill God's purpose for their lives. And so everyone who comes to faith in Christ is, from that point on, a saint. And so this letter, since Paul addressed it to all the saints in Christ Jesus and Philippi, it's addressed to all the Christians there in that city. And then after identifying himself and after identifying the recipients, then a greeting is given to the recipients. And usually it would simply be the word that we would translate as greetings. That's what they'd say, greetings. But that wasn't sufficient for Paul when he was writing to the first century churches. And so here Paul wrote, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote 13 letters to churches and individuals which uh, are part of our New Testament scriptures, 13 books of scripture that Paul wrote in the New Testament. And in all 13 of these books, he begins with some form of this greeting. He changes it a little bit from one book to another, one letter to another. But essentially it has the same, they all have the same greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So if every time that Paul wrote a letter, he included some form of this greeting, well, there must be something in that greeting that is very important, something that's even very profound. Now, as we read Scripture, uh, it's likely that we just skim through those greetings pretty quickly because we want to get on to the, the message itself that's in that book of Scripture. What is it that they're saying? We're probably not all that interested in uh, uh, the greeting that is given. But it would serve us well to spend some time reflecting on the words of these greetings, and that's what we're going to do this morning. After all, it wasn't just specific churches or specific individuals that were the audience for Paul's letters. God intended them for us as well. So we want to give careful attention to all that is said. And it wasn't just Paul who was writing, but he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was being guided by the Holy Spirit as he wrote these letters, these these books of Scripture, even as he wrote the greetings of these letters. And so this wasn't only Paul's desire for the Philippian Christians that they would experience grace and peace from God. This was actually because God was inspiring Paul as he wrote that. This is actually God's desire for us as well. This is God speaking to us, revealing what he wishes for his children. And what God wishes, what God desires, is that we would experience grace and peace. So we want to dig into that a little bit more today. Uh, Today we're only going to look at one of those two words, and that's the word grace. 
hopefully another Sunday we can think uh, more deeply about the peace of God that he offers us, but, but that's a whole other sermon in itself. And so we're only going to look at the word grace today. Now that, of course, is a word that we use often in the church. We sing about it in many of our hymns and songs. And in fact, if you've noticed, that was the theme of all of the songs that we sang so far this morning. They all had to do in one way or another with the grace of God. But even though we use that word a lot and we sing about it often, maybe we're not exactly clear in our minds just what the word means. And uh, so let me give you the simplest definition of the word for grace as it's found in Scripture. And it simply means the undeserved favor of God. God's grace is his undeserved favor. God has shown favor toward us. God has acted favorably on our behalf. How so? Well, of course, God has shown his grace, his undeserved favor toward us in lots of ways, but the main way God has done that, of course, is in the coming of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be reconciled to God, so our relationship with God can be made right. Through the death of Jesus, we are granted then the gift of eternal life. And we did nothing to earn it. This is all God's undeserved favor that he grants us. In fact, not only did we not earn it or deserve his favor, Scripture tells us that just the opposite is true. Romans 6.23 reminds us that the wages of sin is death. Wages, of course, are what we earn. We put in a full day's work, and from that, what we have earned, what we deserve, is a full day's pay. Wages are what we earn. And so through our sin against God, Scripture tells us, by our turning away from God, what we have earned, the wages of that, is death. Eternal death. Eternal separation from God. That's actually pretty obvious that that should be the case because when you think about it, God is the source of life. God is the source of eternal life. And when we sin, we turn away from God. And so if we turn away from the one who is the source of life, well, then we've cut ourselves off from that life. So, of course, death is the result of that, of turning away from God. And so... As scripture says then, the wages of sin is death. That's really what we deserve. But God has acted favorably toward us. God doesn't treat us on the basis of what we deserve, of what we, of what we have earned, but rather God treats us on the basis of his forgiving love. We can enjoy the fullness of life now, and we can look forward to eternity in the loving presence of God Because despite our sin against him, God has acted toward us in grace. That's what Paul was saying in Ephesians 2 that Leah read for us earlier in our service. There Paul reminded us that we were all dead in our transgressions and sins because we had turned from God. We were spiritually dead. We'd separate ourselves from God. But God made us alive with Christ. Thus it is by God's grace and only by God's grace that we have been saved. We have received God's undeserved favor through Jesus Christ. We've earned death, but God is gracious and he doesn't give us what we deserve. God gives us so much more than we ever could earn. Richard Mao was the president of uh, the seminary that I attended in the U.S., Fuller Theological Seminary. He's retired now. Uh, But he uh, wrote an article once for a magazine, and and I read that article, and I wrote part of what he said down uh, because I found it especially meaningful. And uh, in this article, he wrote about a teacher that he had while he was a student in school. It was a science teacher, and so this is what he said. I had a science teacher once, who created what he considered to be a no-nonsense method of assigning grades in his courses. Your final grade was based on how many points you had accumulated throughout the semester. 
The points, in turn, could be earned in a variety of ways. Daily quizzes, lab reports, a lengthy midterm exam, and a final exam. If, by the time the final exam came along, and you had already built up enough points for a B or a C, and if you were content with that grade, you could skip the final. Or you could take it easy for a while earlier on, skipping quizzes and lab reports, and hope that by cramming you could get the points you needed on one of the big tests. Well, probably many of us have had teachers who used that kind of a grading system or one very similar to that. You accumulated points and that determined your grade. Some of you are teachers and maybe you use that kind of a grading system. But then Richard Mao goes on in this article to say something about his teacher that probably different from the teachers that we had. He goes on to write, this teacher who also let it be known that he had no use for religious beliefs, had a clever way of introducing his point system to his classes. There is no Jesus factor in this class, he would announce. There's no Jesus factor. In other words, each student would get exactly what they earned. No excuses. And so... If the dog ate your lab report before you turned it in, too bad. If your alarm didn't go off and so you missed the morning class and thus you missed the daily quiz, so you didn't get any points for that quiz, tough luck. If your boyfriend broke up with you the day before the final exam and you were too distraught to study, find someone else's shoulder to cry on. If you miss an A for the semester by five one-hundredths of a point, as our son once did in a math class, don't expect to be bumped up just because you were so close because you missed that A by a mere five one-hundredths of a point. No excuses, no mercy. You got just what you earned, and the points and the points alone determine the grade that you earned. In other words, no Jesus factor. Isn't it interesting that a man who said he had no use for religious beliefs and thus no use for Jesus still knew what Jesus stood for? Jesus stood for grace. Jesus stood for mercy. Jesus stood for getting something other, for, for, for getting something other than what you deserve. Jesus was determined that we should get something that is so great and so wonderful and so priceless that there's no way we could ever earn it. But we can receive it as a free gift. I suppose when it comes to grades in school, they should accurately represent what the student deserves. I mean, if you've only done C work, you should not expect to be bumped up to a B and certainly not to an A. But aren't you glad that when it comes to the deeper issues of life, there is a Jesus factor? You know, if God were to add up all of our points through religious devotion, through good works, through kind words, through our service here in the church and so forth, we'd all be in big trouble. I mean, not only would our point total to uh, a needed for salvation, not only would that point total fall miserably low, but, but we'd keep on losing points through our lack of religious devotion and through our failure to do good works and through all the bad things that we do. But our standing before God is not based on points. It's not based on what we earn. It's based on the Jesus factor. It's based on the undeserved favor God grants us because of Jesus. Now, it's not that God doesn't appreciate our devotion to him, and it's not that God doesn't desire we would live lives that honor him and that show his love to others. Of course God desires that. It's just that our efforts in these things could never bring our point total up to a passing grade. So in his grace, 
God offers us the gift of life because Jesus took our place on the cross where he died for all of our sin, for all the ways that we have failed to live up to God's standard. God longs for us to receive his grace, to experience his love. As I said, it was the Holy Spirit who was inspiring Paul when he wrote these words of Scripture, even this simple greeting. And so in this simple greeting, it's not only Paul, but it's God saying to us that what I want you to experience is my grace. I want you to experience the fullness of my grace. I want you to be free from guilt because uh, I have forgiven all of your sins at the cross. I want you to know the transforming power of my love at work in your lives. I want you to live without fear, for I am with you always. And when this life ends, when when death is at your doorstep, I will usher you into the fullness of my presence forever. God, through Paul, was saying, here is my grace. I have acted with favor toward you in Jesus Christ. Just receive it. That's the Jesus factor. We haven't earned those things, but God gives them to us freely through Christ. So when Paul writes, grace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he is, first of all, encouraging us to open our hearts to the fullness of God's redeeming grace. And then he's also inviting us to reflect on the richness and the depth of the grace that God has shown us Uh, in forgiving our sins and in giving us life on the basis of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You know, the people that Paul was writing to, the uh, uh, saints in Philippi, the Philippian Christians, they had already experienced God's saving grace in their lives. They already were followers of Jesus, as is true for most, if not maybe all of us here today. But Paul reminds them of this incredible grace of God. And so he says to them and he says to us, Think on God's grace daily. As you live out each day, always keep before you the depth of love that God has for you. Reflect on these things, Paul says, because as you do, no matter what is happening in your life, you will be filled with confidence, you will be filled with gratitude, you will be filled with joy. So let your life be rooted in the amazing and transforming grace of God. The Jesus factor means that rather than being consumed with guilt for our sins, we can be filled with gratitude because God has forgiven all of our sins. Again, it's not that we don't take our sin seriously. Of course we do. We need to confess that. We need to repent of that. But because of the Jesus factor, instead of living with guilt over our sins, we can live with gratitude, knowing that God has forgiven them. Instead of living with the fear that God may not accept us because of how we have lived, we can have the confident assurance that God has already accepted us because of Christ. And again, that's not only what Paul wants for us, that's what God wants for us. First of all, to experience his saving grace through the death of Christ, and then every day to live in the reality of his grace. And as we do, to live with that deep sense of joy and gratitude and confidence that we can have knowing that God is gracious to us. He grants us his undeserved favor. That can be our experience. As you may know, joy is the theme of this letter to the Philippians. And Paul wrote this letter while he was a Roman prisoner. And yet, even while a prisoner, Paul could experience deep in his soul the joy of the Lord because he never forgot God's grace to him, which demonstrated, of course, how much God valued him. God's grace leads to gratitude And gratitude leads to joy. And that's what God wants for us. And that's what we can experience as we simply open our hearts to and bask in the wonder of God's grace. So let me encourage you daily, just take a few moments to reflect on the wonder, the sheer wonder of God's grace toward you and that you can experience that afresh each and every day. What a great gift that is.
But it's not only in the experience of God's grace uh, in forgiving our sins leading to salvation that we receive God's grace. It's not something that happens only once when we open our hearts to Christ and after that, well, God's grace is sort of just a memory of something that happened long ago. No, God's grace is something that we can experience in new and fresh ways each and every day of our lives. One of the ways that we experience God's grace on an ongoing basis is how he comes to our aid when we are going through times of difficulty, even through times of trial or suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes about his thorn in the flesh. Now, he never identifies for us exactly what this thorn in the flesh was. Some think that this thorn in the flesh was some kind of physical ailment that he had that he could not be cured of. Others speculate that this thorn in the flesh was an individual or perhaps a group of people who followed him wherever he went, harassing him, making life difficult for him, interfering in his ministry and so forth. But what, we don't know what it was, but whatever this thorn was, Paul wanted desperately to be free from it. And so he says that three times he prayed that God would take away this thorn in the flesh. But God refused to do it because God knew that Paul needed this thorn in the flesh. Why? Well, as Paul goes on to say, it was because he had received these tremendous revelations from God. And so that he would not become proud and think more highly of himself than he ought, God allowed this thorn in the flesh to help keep Paul humble. This thorn reminded Paul that while God had graciously granted him the privilege of of seeing things no one had ever seen before, he writes about being taken up into heaven and, and seeing things that can't even be described with words. In spite of that, and and of course, uh, being used of God in such a mighty way, helping to plant the church in the first century world, still, in spite of all of these things, these privileges that God granted Paul, still, Paul was simply a human being who faced the same temptation to pride that we all do. And so Paul had to learn that He always had to remain completely dependent on God every day of his life. The fact that he had these special revelations from God didn't mean that he was in kind of a like a special category of people. No, he was simply a human being who faced the same challenges in life that we all did. So God did not take away that thorn in the flesh. But what God did promise Paul was, as he writes there in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. In the midst of this challenging trial, God assured Paul that he was not going to abandon him, that his grace would be sufficient, that by his grace, God would provide all that he needed, even in the midst of this trial. God would give him the strength that he needed to endure, the courage he needed to press on, the perseverance he needed to remain faithful to God, and the assurance that he needed that that even in the midst of this trial, that God would be working all things together for good. God is always there for us, including in our times of deepest need. And he will be working in ways that that are based on his perfect wisdom and his infinite love. And he does this not because we deserve his care, but because God is gracious. And his grace is always enough to see us through. His grace is always sufficient for us. But it's not only in salvation, and it's not only in times of trial or difficulty that we can experience God's grace. The fact is, God pours his grace out on us each and every day. Now, We may not always be aware of it. Sometimes we're just oblivious to it. We're too caught up in the uh, events of that day and so forth. But, But God's grace surrounds us. It encompasses us. It sustains us each and every day. By his grace, God supplies all of our needs. For for all of our needs, He, he gives us health and strength. He supplies us with 
families who love us, with friends who encourage us, with brothers and sisters in Christ who help nurture us in our faith. By His grace, He surrounds us with the beauty of creation simply so that we can enjoy it, especially here in Switzerland. He directs our lives so that we have a deep sense of meaning and purpose. He gives us talents and abilities so that we can accomplish things of value and importance with our lives, which leads to a sense of satisfaction. He speaks His eternal truth to us through His Word. He guides us by His Holy Spirit. He renews our minds so we can know what is uh, ultimately true and lasting. He transforms our character so we become more like Christ. He promises us his complete faithfulness and he assures us that no matter what happens, no matter what we do, we can never be separated from his love. He will never leave us or forsake us, but he's with us in every circumstance. We can know his presence, his love with us always, whether we're here in church, whether we're at the office, whether we're at home whether we're at a restaurant or hiking through the mountains or relaxing on the beach or walking through the city center or wherever. In all of these ways, in all of these experiences of life, God is saying to us, you matter to me. And because you matter to me, I want to bless your life with all of these good things. The Jesus factor means that every moment of every day, God is acting favorably toward us, filling us with his love, strengthening us when we are weak, guiding us toward his good purposes, protecting us from evil, surrounding us with his presence, working all things for good. And he does all of these things, not on the basis of what we deserve, but because of his unlimited love for us. This is the grace of God, his continuous generosity in giving us all the good things that we could never earn. But he gives them to us anyway because he loves us. And when we know this, it gives us such confidence as we face each and every day because we then know that no matter what we encounter, each day is a day to experience God's loving and generous grace. Perhaps there was some time in your past when when you really blew it, and you did some really bad things, and now you think that God could never accept you. But the Jesus factor says that God has forgiven all of our sins at the cross, and so as we open our hearts to him, he receives us as his children, no matter our past. Or maybe you are striving as hard as you can to be good enough to try to earn God's approval. But in your, the back of your mind is the haunting fear that you'll never be able to be good enough. The Jesus factor sets us free from that burden. Again, not that we don't try to live a life that's pleasing to God. It's, of course, we do that. It's just that we don't have to try to earn God's approval or earn our salvation or anything because everything that God gives us is simply a free gift for us to receive. And so in this simple salutation, this simple greeting at the beginning of this letter, Paul really is saying something that is earth-shattering. He's saying something that is life-changing. He is saying that there is a new way of living available to all of us because the Jesus factor has become a reality. And that changes everything. Because of what Jesus has done for us. He says, know deep in your soul that every day God is pouring out his grace, his undeserved grace favor on you. Every day you can wake up and you can just say the, uh, just a, a simple prayer. Maybe prayer is new to you or whatever. You say, God, I don't know what this day has in store for me, but I know that somehow in some way this day you're going you're gonna to grant me your undeserved favor. What a great way to start the day because that's how God wants us to start the day. Through this salutation, 
Paul and God are saying to us that that you can be confident in all the circumstances of life. You can face every circumstance without fear because God is with you. And in everything, you can know his joy and have the assurance of his presence with you now and for all of eternity. This is what Paul desired for us. This is what God desires for us, that we would experience his grace afresh each and every day. And this is the quality of life that we can experience because of the Jesus factor, because God is a gracious God. Let us pray. Dear God, we praise you because you are a gracious God. Thank you for all the ways you pour out your grace upon us. All the ways you act favorably toward us. Thank you for your grace in forgiving our sins through the death of Christ and raising us to new life through the power of the resurrection. Thank you for your grace in directing our lives in providing for our needs, in assuring us daily of your love, in bringing good even out of the difficult circumstances of life. Thank you for your grace and all the blessings you grant us. Lord, may our hearts continually be filled with gratitude and joy because of the richness of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.